This is the third week of five in a series that takes its title from this blue book entitled Safe People. Um, I've told you at the beginning of each message that uh, one of the principal reasons that I chose to do this series this fall is that because we as a church family say that we want to take Jesus' second great commandment seriously. And we want to practice together. We want to live together, loving our neighbors the way that we ourselves want to be loved. And what you find is that that's a very easy thing to say and it's a very hard thing to do. Because when you really try to love people, real people, it gets messy. They don't always respond the way that you wish they would respond and on down the line. So we needed a series that gets us beneath the surface of that idea of loving each other like neighbors, of reaching out to the neighbors that you know who are not a part of our church family and caring for them too. And this series is meant to do that. In the first week of the series, I told you you can envision the entire story of the Bible as a circle. That God designed the world and the human race one way, and then we, through our choices, decided we didn't want that And we wanted it a different way. And the chaos and the pain and the disorder of our world is largely due to that choice. And what God is doing through Jesus and Jesus' followers is remaking the world and bringing it back up to how he originally wanted it to work. Last week, we talked about the opposite of safe people. We talked about unsafe people. And I will mention to you anonymously what somebody uh, this morning said about last week. They said, man, that was dark. This is the quote. That was dark and that was gloomy. Uh, My paraphrase, that was really hard to talk about the world in which you and I live and how people can be very unsafe for us. Unsafe meaning not trustworthy, not dependable. They can be risky. They can be volatile. They can inflict wounds on us. And sometimes we don't even see them coming. Yeah, that's the world you live in. Sometimes that's what your friends are like. Sometimes that's what your family is like. Sometimes that's what you're like. Um, Today, we're going to talk about unsafe people again. Here's my promise, though. As we get real about the world in which you and I live, I promise you that in the next couple of weeks, we'll begin to talk about the alternative toward which Jesus points us. We of all people as his followers are called to be safe. Even though we all have natural inherent tendencies to be unsafe, Jesus calls us to something better. So if you hang on with me, and we get real about how broken you and I really are in our relationships to one another, then we'll be able to chart a different course forward. Let me start today with this passage from Genesis. This is very soon after God makes the human race, creates it to function perfectly and in harmony with one another, to function safely together. And then, as you know, if you were here for the first week of the series a couple of weeks ago, that is not how things stayed. And the human race fell apart. They drifted away from one another. They rejected one another. They blamed one another. This is the story of Genesis chapter 3. And those first human beings, Adam and Eve, had sons. Their son, their first two sons were named Abel and Cain. And the story of those first two sons is told in the first part of Genesis chapter 4. And if you have ever been in church before, or maybe you haven't been, you're probably still nonetheless familiar with this first tragedy told in the Bible. It is put there in Genesis chapter 4 to tell you just how quickly and just how devastatingly the human race came undone. You thought Genesis 3 was bad, it gets a whole lot worse by Genesis 4. By the second generation of human beings, you have the first murder. You have one brother taking another brother into a field and killing him. 
And this verse occurs right after that first murder. God shows up and says to the surviving murderous brother Cain, Hey, where's your brother Abel? To which Cain replies, What? Am I my brother's keeper? Which in ancient Hebrew can also mean caretaker or even shepherd. Ah, now if you're familiar with the story of Cain and Abel, you get the point. You might even say the very sick joke that Cain was making. What do I mean? Well, what was Abel's profession? Abel was a shepherd. And when God shows up and says to Cain, Hey, where's your brother? More to the point. Uh, what exactly has gone on here, Cain? He mocks his dead brother and says, using a very similar word to the one about Abel's profession, Am I my brother's shepherd? He took care of goats. He took care of lambs. Do I have to take care of him? Is this what you intended, God Almighty, was for the human race to be one another's caretakers? This is how poorly, this is how badly things got so fast. Two generations before Cain, God created the human race to be one another's caretaker. And very quickly they decided they didn't want to be. You and I live in a world defined by Cain. There is no more definitive character, there is no more definitive verse in the history of the human race about why we experience what we do sometimes in our relationships with one another than Genesis chapter 4 verse 9. Are we one another's keeper? You and I live in a world where we are told that you need to be responsible for you. And that's true. But we do not live in a world where we think we're responsible for each other's well-being, each other's wellness. We live in a world defined by Cain. Societies are often defined by Cain. Ours and others historically and across the globe. There are always people in cultures that that particular culture doesn't think it needs to take responsibility for. Oftentimes it's the poorest, the most marginalized, the people who are different, maybe in color or religion. This has defined the human race. Cain lives in every culture in every country. This is what we're like as human beings. But see, it's even true for you and for me. There are people we want to take responsibility for, and then there are people we don't. Even the people that we do want to take responsibility for, we may even feel obligated to do it, like our family, our spouse, our kids. We will oftentimes put limits on how much ownership we take for their wellness, and it is to their detriment. We can only do so much, we think, and our definition of how much we can do falls short of being one another's shepherd, caretaker, keeper. The human race looks an awful lot like Cain. And this is why we're unsafe for each other. Today I want to talk to you about the three broad categories of unsafe people that uh, the book describes. I want to talk to you about the damage that they do. This is Cain. He who was not his brother's keeper. We know what damage he did. You'll find out more damage that he did at the end of the message too. Let's talk about some of the unsafe people you encounter and what they're like. Now here's the deal about these types of people that we talk about. Um, odds are you've encountered one who fits into at least all three categories. The harder thing to see or admit, and you don't have to do it to anybody but yourself, is you're going to fit into one of these categories too. Not all the time. I'm not saying you're like this all the time. I am saying that every one of us has an inclination toward at least one of these, maybe two, 
not all three. So you will see yourself in this as much as you see other people. In the book, we are told that often Cain shows up in our life, these people who refuse to be our keepers, responsible caretakers, as abandoners. What's an abandoner? You have experienced an abandoner when they talk a good game at the front of their relationship with you, but their follow-through is terrible. In fact, oftentimes they'll quit unexpectedly, inadvertently, maybe at the worst possible moment. They start well, they continue or end poorly. That's what an abandoner is like. Which means they also talk a better game about relationships than they actually are willing to live out. Pretty predictably, they're going to leave you when either A, things in the relationship get tough, things get messy, or things get too real and too intimate because they don't want to be that close to you or to anybody. Now see, some of you have probably experienced this in a severe way. You've had a spouse walk out on you. They abandoned you. If you've ever known anyone who was adopted, uh, our family has a very close friend who is adopted. And she, for much of her adult life, has wrestled on and off with feeling abandoned by her birth parents. You might know someone like that too. But it's not just those big things. You probably have had friends who have abandoned you in some kind of way. Sometimes the abandoner doesn't walk away. They don't leave you entirely. What they do is they shut down the relationship or put a limit on it. And you think, gosh, is this person going to be close to me? Is this someone who will really not just be an acquaintance, but be a kindred spirit, someone who will walk beside me through thick and through thin? Will they be my partner? Can I support them and they support me? And you find out after a few months in the relationship, they put a limit or a boundary on how far they're willing to go with you. So you may still be in some kind of relationship with them, but they don't want it to go any further than the limit they decided. And what you need to see is that abandoners hurt people. They leave wounds. Uh, you may not know this about me. I suspect many of you are going to be like what I'm about to say about myself. I don't ask for, I don't ask for help easily. In fact, I'm very bad at it. Uh, I give help readily. I ask for help rarely. Um, this is who I am for many reasons. Uh, fairly recently, more recently than I'm going to admit, I went through a time where I was desperate, where I got to the end of my rope. And this doesn't happen to me that often, because um, usually I work pretty hard at trying to fix my own problems or other people's problems. And like I said, I don't ask for help. I tend to take things on my own shoulders. But this was one of those rare instances where I had had it. And I, I got into something that I knew I couldn't fix. I could not be the solution to this problem that I was facing. And I didn't know where to turn. So I turned to somebody very close to me, somebody very important to me, and I asked for help. And I just threw myself basically at their mercy, at their whim. I picked up the phone and I said, man, I need you right now. I need you to help me. And they didn't. What they did is they said, I think you're looking at this wrong. Let me tell you how I think you should be looking at this situation. Let me tell you why I think you're wrong and how you're perceiving how bad this is for you. And they left it there. And they never helped. They never offered me advice. They never offered me a practical hand of support or encouragement. And I'm still in a relationship with this person, but you can tell. It has left a bruise that will not go away. And I know now that in this particular relationship there are limits. And I will probably never ask this person for help again. The sad fact is, it's made a person who doesn't ask for help a whole lot even more reticent to ask for help anyway, to anybody. Some of you have experienced that too. 
Here's the second way Cain shows up in the human race. In you and in me and among the people who are our friends. This is how we're not each other's keeper. There are critics among us who have hurt you, or maybe you're a critic and you've hurt somebody else. What's a critic? A critic is somebody who is more concerned with everybody's mistakes or imperfections than with human connection or relationship. These people avoid human weakness at all costs in themselves and each other. That is to say, well, I'll say it this way, they'd hate today. Because we're talking about human brokenness and weakness today. Critics will not like what I'm talking about. That's what I mean, and that's what the book means by avoiding human weakness. They tend to be much harder on other people. Their standards for other people tend to be much higher than they actually are on themselves. We talked about this last week where it's the speck in your, in somebody else's eye versus the log in your own eye. That's the story that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 7. They overestimate the problems in others. They underestimate the problems in themselves. And as such, these people are exceedingly controlling. Through their criticism, through their little jabs, through the way they needle you or nag you, they are trying to control you. Have you known people like that? How did they affect you? There's someone very close to me who grew up in a home with a critic. In fact, a flaming critic. An unmitigated, unapologetic, will not change critic. What do you think happened to that person who is now an adult? This person lives on eggshells, worried that he or she is always going to disappoint somebody. This person is the kind of friend who always thinks that the mistakes they made are bigger than they actually are. So you're always having to tell them, relax, it's not a big deal. Relax. But I know where it comes from. I know why it's there. This person thinks that they have to make everybody in their life happy in order for them to be happy. Because the critic in their home when they were growing up made them think that if they didn't do things exactly how this critic wanted, they would hear about it and they would pay. And this person, as you might guess, as is often the case, can struggle with being critical too. Have any of you experienced a critic that left a wound on you? Odds are the answer is yes. Have you ever criticized somebody in a way that left a mark that maybe only now you're beginning to see how significant it was. Critics are not their brother's keepers. And here's the third category. The book calls them irresponsibles. What's an irresponsible look like? They do not care about their own well-being or the well-being of others. They don't care about their physical health. They very often do not manage their emotional or psychological or spiritual health very well. And they are not very aware of how they impact other people in that same way. They can't delay gratification, which means whatever they want, they want it right now. And they cannot figure out how to delay that or take the long view. They have no perspective on the domino effect or the ripple effect of their own behavior on other people. They live in a way, in a very self-centered way. They only see how their behavior or words affect themselves. They have no sense of how it will hit somebody else and then how that will hit somebody else and on outward. The thing about these particular people, the book notes, is that they're really likable. These people are often fun great to be around. You have friends, I'm sure, 
who are irresponsibles, and you like them. But here's the other thing you know about them. You can't depend on them. They're not trustworthy. They're not faithful. In fact, they're volatile. You never know what you're going to get. One day it's over here, one day it's over here. One day they're up, one day they're down. They surprise you sometimes with how strongly or fiercely or fiery their response is to something, and it seems like it comes out of nowhere. That's what volatile means. That's what they're like. And oftentimes these are the people who expect a great deal from you, and they expect far less from themselves. They expect you to do more for them or be more for them than you would ever expect of them. For any of you in the last five years as a part of our church family who have tried to reach out to a neighbor in need, you may have experienced an irresponsible. In fact, if I were to pause right now and have some of you who are on our Barnabas Project team that manage our church's Love Your Neighbor money, um, you could tell story after story about trying to help someone who might fit into the category of being an irresponsible. They're in grave need for whatever reason. They made bad financial choices and they are in need. They're about to kick, get kicked out of their apartment. They made bad relational choices, so their second marriage is dissolving or their third marriage is dissolving. And they need your help and they're desperate. And they often come to a friend, or in our case, to a church, in that time of great crisis. And wanting to follow the words of Jesus and love them deeply as he commanded us to do, we give to them and we sacrifice for them and we open our lives for them. And then a month or two later you realize, wow, they never really meant anything. They were very willing to take and now that the crisis has died down, they've really not made any substantive change, nor are they willing to. That's a textbook irresponsible. And go ahead, you can admit with me, it is disappointing when that happens. Sometimes, depending on how much you have personally invested, it's heartbreaking. To watch this person that you cared about a great deal just go about their lives in the same way, knowing that they are setting themselves up for a future catastrophe similar to the one they asked you to enter in the past. This is what an irresponsible looks like. So up on the screen are the three ways that we as human beings tend not to be one another's caretakers. This is how we do not take personal responsibility for one another. As I said, you probably experience this month in and month out, sometimes in small ways, not big ways. We ourselves all have at least a tendency to one of these, and the wisest among us will know what your personal tendency is. Here, however, is why it's so important that we can talk openly about these kinds of people, what they look like, which we might be, and the damage that they do. And it is simply because in the human race, hurt people hurt people. You need to remember that. Now, I get it. Talking about interpersonal hurt often elicits two polar opposite reactions in people. Some people feel completely overwhelmed by the hurt dealt to them by others. They feel incapacitated or paralyzed by it. They can't get over it. Sometimes they won't seek the help necessary to get over it. This may be where you feel you are today or in your life. Maybe you know somebody like that. They are drowning in what the canes of their life have done to them. 
Ah, but here's the opposite reaction. Yeah, I don't dwell on the past. I don't like to think about how other people have hurt me. I'm impervious. I walk through life with a suit of plate mail and nothing can get through. Um, here's what you need to know about the hurts that have been caused you. Uh, so about two summers ago, um, Eli and I are having one of our epic sheer badminton games in the backyard. And they are epic. Because we run all, the goal is not to beat the other person and get the little birdie on the ground, it's to keep it in the air as long as we possibly can. Which means that we're running everywhere and diving everywhere trying to keep this thing up in the air. Dad, as a former athlete, I emphasize former, <laughs> tends to try things that he, his mid-40-year-old body probably shouldn't. And so maybe two summers ago, my son sort of shanks one, and it's about 15 yards away from me, and I got no time to get there. And so I take off, like a bolt out of heaven, I assure you, to get to the birdie as it descends to the ground. And I hear my knee pop. Uh -huh, thank you. And, and, and like, I never show pain, ever. And I crumpled to the ground like a whimpering child. And I like, you freaked Eli out because he's never seen me like that. Well, I tore my meniscus in my knee. And me being me, I've never gotten it fixed. But here's a funny thing that's happened to me over the last two years. I'm now having Achilles problems on the same leg. I'm having lower back problems and hip problems on the same side of my body. I wonder why, Chris. I thought you were a smart guy. Can't you figure this out? No, no. Unfortunately, I'm more stubborn than smart. I didn't figure it out. My point to you is this. How often do I think about having a torn meniscus in my right knee? Never, unless I'm going up and down the stairs in my house. Never. My body remembers. Not only does my body remember, my body is compensating for the torn meniscus in my knee by limping, by kind of dragging my right leg, which has hurt my Achilles tendon, which has hurt my hip, which is jacking up my back. All of you go ahead. Don't send me the email. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> right. I so deserve that. I get it. The point is go to the doctor. At some point, I will. No. My point to you is this. I appreciate the spirit of the thought that you are not going to dwell on or be defined by the hurts of your past. But they are your torn meniscus. You don't get to pick whether or not they damaged you. They did. And whether or not you're willing to admit it or are consciously even aware of it, you are compensating for especially the big hurts that people have dealt you. This is why I mentioned uh, someone, for instance, who has been abandoned in their life will oftentimes swing very far the other direction and they will cling to people and they will not let bad relationships go or they will be the one to take on their shoulders the entirety of the responsibility to keep the friendship good and well in a very unhealthy way that is them compensating for being abandoned and all of us when you learn to see how you have been hurt by the abandoners, the critics, and the irresponsibles, you will find that you have those wounds too. And those wounds oftentimes are reflected in your behavior to other people. Here's where Cain comes into the story. So Cain, Genesis chapter 4 tells us, begin to have children. He has a son, his son takes a wife, they have a son, and on down the line. By the end of Genesis chapter 4, we pause again in the story of the first humans, and we land on somebody named Lamech. Lamech is Cain's great-grandson. This is how swell of a guy Lamech is. The only thing we know about Lamech is he's a skilled tradesman, he's good with metals, okay, that sounds okay, now, that's what happens next. 
we have a recorded uh, love note that he gave to his two wives. And in this note of great affection to his two wives, he says, hey, you two, I want you to remember something. I killed a man for just looking at me wrong. I slew somebody for talking to me wrong. Don't you two ever forget it. We have, by the end of Genesis chapter 4, the fourth chapter in your entire Bible, the great-grandson of Cain the murderer is now an abuser of his wives and a mass or multiple murderer himself. If Cain started the movement in the human race not to be one another's shepherd, Lamech is the epitome. He is the climax of how the ripple effect from Cain took hold in who we are. You're not Lamech. I'm not Lamech either. But just like Cain produced Lamech, you and I have been damaged by each other too. And you and I have been influenced in how we behave toward other people by those wounds that we've been dealt. And really the goal of this series and the goal of Jesus in your life and in the world is to stop that cycle of hurt. This is why we have to talk very openly about the wounds that we have been dealt and how deep a mark they've left. Because if you're not willing to do that, I don't know that Jesus can change it. Jesus came to save you from an unsafe world, a world that you didn't choose, a world into which you were born. He came to point a different way. He came to show you that the world can be safe again, or at least you're part of it. You can choose to be a safe person, trustworthy and dependable. You can choose to not put the people around you at risk of being hurt or damaged by the worst angels of your nature. You can choose to identify, yeah, in my worst moments, I tend to abandon people. I give up on them. I tend to criticize people, think I'm better than they are. I tend to be irresponsible with people's feelings, with relationships themselves. Yeah, at my worst, that's me. And as you do, he will begin to change it. The whole point here is to create safe people. This is what it means when we say, Jesus saves you. Or at least a big part of it. He did not save you to go to heaven someday after you die, though that is part of it. He saved you to change you now. And he saved you to become a safe person for the people around you. Here's what I'd like you to do at the end of the message. And Ben, why don't you come on up and grab your guitar. On your chairs today are some blank 3 by 5 cards. There's lots of them, so I'm sure there's one by you. There's also lots of pens. What I would like you to do today is I want you to answer one or both of the questions up on the screen for yourself. And you need to number which question it is. So if you're answering number one, put a number one on the paper. If you're answering number two, put number two on the paper. If you're doing both, make sure you clearly label them. Do not put your name. Do not put the name of the person who hurt you or who you've hurt. Keep it completely generic or anonymous. Okay? I would like you to at least be open enough to what we talked about today to identify one way that you have experienced either of those questions. So would you answer one or both of those questions in an anonymous way on those three by five cards? Take a minute or two to do that while Ben plays. Then I'm going to tell you what we're going to do with those cards.